Good evening, I'm Ryan Bonazzo. Thank you for joining us. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh visited our city today to deliver a campaign announcement on the elimination of drug costs. Our TVT News staff also spoke to Singh about a number of regional topics, including his plan for FedNor if he's elected Prime Minister. Corey Nordstrom has that story. Jagmeet Singh made his second visit to Thunder Bay in the last month, announcing his pledge for universal pharmacare. The NDP leader also voiced his opinion on FedNor, where he believes the current Liberal government has taken the wrong approach. The no-strings-attached approach hasn't worked. So if we make investments, they have to be tied to jobs. There is no, poor, no point in FedNor making an investment in a sector or in an industry or in a company if there aren't ironclad guarantees that's, that it's actually going to create a benefit for workers. More work for the local Alstom plant could also be in the cards if Singh is elected Prime Minister. When we're purchasing with our, our public dollars, so we're buying trains for uh, Via Rail, Canadian, the Canadian Crown Corporation, we should be buying Canadian-made products. Singh spoke with regional First Nations leaders while in the city as he looks to create plans that address some of their needs. They mentioned inadequate housing and the lack of clean drinking water as issues that further their feelings of hopelessness. When we talk about the, the mental health crisis, we need investments in mental health. We need supports for Indigenous-led learning um, on, the, on the ground, on the land. There's a lot of um, on-the-land healing that can happen with good programs. But we also need to make sure that the quality of life in terms of housing and clean drinking water, when those are established, it really makes life uh, better. Singh also pledges to make access to clean drinking water a priority if his government takes power. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. For the second time over the past two weeks, local Liberal candidate Patty Haidu was the target of some rowdy protesters. A small but vocal group showed up outside her campaign office yesterday afternoon to voice their frustration about vaccine mandates. Haidu wasn't there, but she says her campaign team felt intimidated enough to eventually call city police. She says she can appreciate that everyone is frustrated with COVID-19 and wants the pandemic to be over and done with. But she hopes people can understand that getting vaccinated is the key to finally putting COVID behind us. As for the recent instances of aggressive behavior, Haidu's again asking all sides to remain respectful. I'll just urge people to remember that democracy is built on respect. It's built on a respect for uh, healthy debate, public discourse about the best way to run our country, what our country needs now. Um, but there's no room for violence in, uh, in any of this. There's no room for intimidation of other people that maybe have different perspectives. For the second straight day, the number of active COVID-19 cases in the Thunder Bay District has fallen. This despite a new infection being reported by the health unit today. It's in the Thunder Bay area and the exposure source is still unknown at this time. There are now four active cases across the district, one fewer than on Thursday. And the one COVID-19 patient across the district who had been hospitalized with the virus has now been released. Meanwhile, there are no new cases today in the Northwestern Health Unit. There are still five active cases there. The Ontario government is reportedly considering implementing a provincial vaccine passport program as COVID-19 cases rise across the province. Sources have, sold, have told CTV News that the idea hasn't come before cabinet yet, but the situation is fluid. There have been multiple calls from doctors and experts across the province to make vaccines mandatory for any indoor public places. Quebec and British Columbia have already introduced proof of vaccination programs, allowing only fully vaccinated people to participate in non-essential activities, such as going to restaurants and sporting events. Canadian travelers still aren't able to cross the U.S. land border. That means businesses on the American side of the Pigeon River continue to struggle. Officials with Ryden's Border Store and Grand Portage Lodge and Casino thought their government would follow the Canadian lead and open the U.S. border to visitors last week. But instead, they'll have to wait until at least September 21st. William Dougal has more on that. Canada opened its border to fully vaccinated non-essential U.S. travelers on August 9th, and American businesses on the other side hoped that they would follow soon after. But U.S. leaders decided to keep land borders closed for yet another month. 
Co-owner of Ryden's Border Store, Lori and Mike Boomer, say they have been hugely impacted by the absence of Canadian travelers over the past year and a half. The southern border is a mess. Now there's Afghanistan, and this whole northern border, I just feel like we're just lost in the shuffle. And we're the ones doing everything right. The Canadians would follow the rules, we're following the rules, and here we sit dead in the water. And it's a similar story at Grand Portage Lodge and Casino, which also depends heavily on border traffic. Enterprise Administrator Brian Sherburn says he can't wait to get the Canadians back across the border. We definitely miss our friends from the north and we get telephone calls, we get messages on social media and, and there's a lot of people that want to get back to doing you know, the things they like to do to get out of town for a little jaunt. And we look forward to the day that we can invite our friends from Thunder Bay back down to visit us. We're 60-40, 60% Canadians and 40% U.S. And, it's really, and that starts to change to more Canadians as the U.S. families, the kids get back to school, so, you know, softball tournaments are over, things like that, baseball tournaments are over. So the duty-free, we really look forward to the Canadians coming home. That's, that's, you know, that's a big part of our business. We miss them a lot. Even if the U.S. border does open up next month, the owner of Ryden's Gas Bar says he's concerned about how many people are going through all the COVID testing requirements to make the trip down to Ryden's like they used to. I don't know what the restrictions if they do open, how good it's going to be for us because of the testing and whatnot that they're going to need. Like all my people, all my locals that come, you know, every couple of days and buy gas or go to the casino, they're not going to be able to just run across like they used to, I don't believe, at first. And for now, it's just a waiting game, as the U.S. will decide in mid-September whether to extend the border closure for another month, depending on the COVID variant situation at that time. William Dougal, TBT News. Neighbors are questioning the feasibility of a proposed residential subdivision south of Highway 61 off of Mountain Road. The developer, Shore Bay Estates, invited nearby property owners to an open house this week to take a closer look at the plans and technical reports and to get some answers. The proposed development includes a maximum of 69 new homes built over four stages, that has some locals concerned that the project will negatively affect those who already live in the Mountain Road community. Specifically, they want to know whether the existing infrastructure can sustain the added traffic the subdivision would bring. Resident Rosemary McNabb believes until the city improves roads and sidewalks, there shouldn't be any more homes. Uh, this, the subdivision that he's proposing is, that, um, is going to use Mountain Road. As, uh, as an access point, and Mountain Road is in, in terrible disrepair. People will also use 15th Side Road, which is also in terrible disrepair, and so we, we cannot at this time support this infrastructure. It could negatively impact the residents that are already here. Like I said, the traffic will increase on roads that already can't support the current traffic. A public meeting to discuss the zoning application has not yet been scheduled. The annual 10x10 10 10 Out Loud Showcase looked a little different this year. The plays were presented at the Waterfront Spirit Garden, and while that environment helped take some of the short plays to another level, they also had to deal with Mother Nature. The event features 10 short plays per day, two at a time, running from 1 p.m. until 5 o'clock. The first performances were today, will also run on Sunday. It's the first time the showcase has been held outdoors and they had to practice in local parks to get ready for the performances. Artistic director Kathy Winslow says they also decided to approach admission differently this year as well. In the past we've always sold out all of our shows and this year we decided just because of how everything worked with COVID and budget and stuff to offer free admission um, and then plus we're in an outdoor space and because we split up the show we could have more people come to each show than we normally do so some of our shows are sold out and most of them are very nearly sold out because it's, it's quite popular. Winslow says after Sunday afternoon's performances they don't plan to hold the event outdoors again due to the weather uncertainty. The intention is to hold the annual 10x10 10 10 showcase indoors once again next year. It's a day to remember for another lucky winner, thanks to this month's Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Foundation 50-50 draw. Hi, Kathy. It's Glenn Craig calling. How are you today? I'm good. Do you have any plans for lunch, lunch today? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from the hospital. 
You've just won $436,630. Are you kidding me? I am not kidding you. That's wonderful. Quickly turning suspicion into excitement. That's what more than 436 grand can do as this month's winner, Kathy Timchishin, found out today on the other end of that life-altering call from Foundation CEO Glenn Craig. Tim Chishin says certainly the, it's certainly the biggest win of her life and she'll need time for the shock to wear off before deciding what she'll do with the windfall. The other half of the proceeds goes toward life-saving medical equipment at the Regional Health Sciences Centre. Tickets are already available for September's raffle. That draw will actually take place on Friday, October 1st. I have to think it's a pretty cool time every month for Glenn Craig to make that phone call, hear the reaction. I can imagine, yeah. I'm sure it never gets old. No, I can't imagine yeah. it does. Uh, Mitchell, the weather not getting old, a little bit different today. I thought it was supposed to rain all day today, but when I came into work around 3 o'clock, no rain yet. Did it end up coming? The rain did end up coming, but it didn't come too early in the day. Most of the day was pretty cloudy, lots of clouds with the potential of rain. Now, we saw some on and off showers with a low of 15 cooking up to 17, so not much of a difference there. But the rain did kick off later in the day, but not too much earlier, but that wind, 15 to 40 kilometers from the east, definitely pushing those clouds in. Now, the rain we're looking at tonight, as you can see, a big just band all the way across going from the south to the north of uh, the um, the... Currently in uh, Thunder Bay, Kenora at 16. That rain we were talking about coming through the province to the northwest. Red Lake at 19, Sioux Lookout at 18, and 20 in Pickle Lake. And that rain we were talking about coming across, not hitting Armstrong and Greenstone. And when we head to the east from Thunder Bay to Marathon, cooks up just a bit with 16 in Sault Ste. Marie. Now, when we head to tonight, that temperature cooling down to 13 with that rain continuing by the early morning. Thanks a lot, Mitchell. Well, the U.S. is trying to clear up some confusion about yesterday's attack in Kabul. Initially, it was uh, thought that there were two bombings. They're saying now it may have been just one. We'll have details as your Friday News Hour continues. We do not believe that there was a second explosion at or near uh, the Barron Hotel.